kid I was talking to about real software engineering is not about coding. It's about uh, like, and many agile methods are really, if you think about it, focused on the algorithm, the software, the logic where, as I like to call it. And my view is we have to uh, recognize, acknowledge, and have methods that deal with more than code. We have to deal with data and people and hardware and other things. Okay, that's my message. And I've always had that message. It's here in the software engineering management book. I had a term soft crafting, which was done by soft crafters. Okay. And there's a level above this called software engineering. And there's a level above that called systems engineering. Okay, point made, time running off. Uh, here's another similar thing that uh, we, we, uh, we have to do systems level thinking. That means we have to think uh, 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 not least, for example, about all the stakeholders uh, in a large complex system, there can be 100 or more distinct stakeholders with each with their own needs and requirements, all conflicting with everybody else. And I've just written a, a book that I'll share with anybody who asks called uh, Stakeholder Engineering, uh, the end of 2021, to go into detail there. But we, we, we uh, in other words, uh, and we're just not teaching systems level thinking to the software people uh, in our various dialects of agile okay tom can i just clarify a point is that actually systems in generic systems or systems in computer systems okay um i have formal definitions of systems but the point is uh, you you have to define your system and say this is the system i'm talking about system at, at, of in question is systems engineers call it, okay? So it's, uh, it's whatever system you define. My point is not that. My point is the system is certainly a hell of a lot more than the logic and programs. That's my main point. So bring in the data, bring in the people, br uh, including all the stakeholders, bring in the hardware, et cetera. Bring in even the methods themselves, okay? That's my main point. We've got to view more than the algorithm in our trade. So you can all see, I hope, uh, point three, stakeholder engineering, et cetera. And the stakeholder yeah. engineering book, a free copy of, is at the bottom. Uh, sorry, and I say free, I, I, uh, the, the lean pub copy is very large free sample small price, and if you're a poor student and you email me, I will send you a totally free copy. I don't like paywall. I'm, yeah, there, there's the book anyway on stakeholder engineering. Now, the uh, uh, illustra uh, illustration here, on the left-hand side, we have a whole lot of stakeholders. For those who, uh, uh, our, our agile methods keep on talking about users and customers. Somebody needs to turn off their mic and it ain't me. David, maybe? Okay. So, uh, 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 also, uh, for example, and we, we, are, we try to be user friendly with use cases and user stories. We've got to stop that narrow minded nonsense and uh, talk about stakeholders in a much broader perspective. Um, so, here you have t uh, generic types of uh, stakeholders such as um, uh, individuals such as a CEO or CTO. Here you have inanimate stakeholders such as agreements, architecture, contract. Now I'm defining stakeholder as source of requirements, right? And clearly contracts and agreements are source of requirements, laws. And then we have groups of people like the board of directors or the employees. Then we have um, Let's see, uh, a type here called uh, uh, in the environment, for example, um, uh, uh, precipitation of war with Russia environment. And, and then we have uh, uh, weak victims, such as poor people or, or ch children. 
And then we have defenders of victims, such as the councils and the laws. And then we have antagonists like Vladimir Putin, uh, for example, are interesting. They're not exactly users or customers, but you damned well better listen to their requirements or you will get problems, okay? So with this broader picture of stakeholders, and by the way, this is just um, a, uh, a, an example or sample and anybody has to work with their real types of stakeholders and their real stakeholders and their real needs. Um, okay, uh, here we have a, a group of things, I call them the top 10 most critical values or qualities. And, and uh, that is whatever set is your most critical. Here we have a top group of costs, for example, technical debt management later. And here we have a group of the top 10 strategies, which could be called the architecture uh, description. Okay. So uh, now we're looking at uh, uh, the system with my eyes, and we'll see more detail of this in a moment. Okay. Point four, everybody on slide four? <laughs> Anybody on slide four? Yes, slide four. Got it. Okay. Complain if I, uh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't change. So uh, my main point here is the idea of multiple stakeholders, not just the customer or user. I've already made that point, but multiple um, values and qualities that you have to attend to simultaneously. You cannot just uh, focus on one and forget the other. This is the same in real life. You know, just walking down the street, you have to attend to a multiplicity of dangers. You can't just look at the, the people in front of you on the sidewalk, okay? And multiple types of costs, you know, uh, people and time and, and money and future technical debt, okay? And the point is, we, we have to acknowledge that we all have to work in an environment with many values we have to try to deliver. That's the main point of any project. And we have to, to um, recognize many constraints, including many types and levels and timings of resources. And if we do this, we're beginning to do engineering. If, if we uh, forget most of the values and just say the, the uh, rate of programming functionality, uh, we've lost it. If we, if we say the only thing that costs is the time to deadline, then we've lost it. We don't understand. And um, uh, so, so multiple values is what we're delivering. Multiple constraints is what we have to respect. And values over costs is a thing called efficiency. And I'm very interested in, from an engineering sense in the efficiency of what we're doing. Uh, basically, we should be delivering lots of good values at very low cost in a value stream immediately upon starting a project. Let's just say the week after the first week is a good time to do that. Again, more information about architecture efficiency you'll find in a book I've called, uh, got called Systems Engineering Architecture, but here's a chapter on architecture efficiency for those who want to go deeper into the architectural problem. Number five. Um, so, um, uh, so here is a thing I call an impact estimation table. And uh, it, you notice it's got lots of numbers all over the place. So that symbolically tells us we're doing engineering, not programming and coding. Let me assume none of you know anything about it, but I hope many will be very interested to acquire it as a tool for their uh, agile uh, engineering. And uh, on this axis, uh, where it says the little yellow arrows, we have five critical values. And the, uh, uh, they are defined on a scale of measure elsewhere. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, status of all of these uh, um, values is the left-hand number. Okay, this may be the status after uh, uh, delivery, value delivery step or sprint number 23 could be, okay, where we keep track of the 
uh, numerically of, in this case, five different values as we evolve or deliver. The right-hand number is some kind of a target that we wish to reach. And the, the, when the target is reached, the, the, the 90, the 95, et cetera, uh, that's the definition of done. You all remember discussions about when are we done? What is the definition of done in Scrum or Agile? And I say the definition of done is when you've reached your numeric targets, all of them, right? Not when you've written a lot of code and not reached the definitions of what you're really trying to do. So these numbers are the, the key stakeholder values and they are the definition of what the project is all about. And we can have any degree of progress towards the, 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 the number on the right-hand side is a way of tracking how the project is moving along. Now, in addition, we have uh, two uh, resource ideas days to implement and capital cost, but uh, I'm keeping this simple and we could have five or more there. Uh, normally we would have about 10 of these at any one level, 10 values. And normally for a large project, we'd have about 10 qualities. But these are the multiple things I talked about, the multiple values we have to attend to and manage simultaneously. And the multiple costs or resource limitations that we have to tend to simultaneously while we're doing architecture, while we're doing delivery, uh, while we're doing contracting for that matter, okay? Notice on this top axis, we have four different strategies. Let's call them top level architectures. Uh, uh, and in this case, we're actually in a classroom in Norway on about the 8th of March, 2020. And we decided to plan what we do in Norway for the coronavirus. Wasn't that perceptive of us? So that was the, the student project. And uh, so, uh, so th th these uh, health architecture is just a tag or a name of something which is described in far more detail, uh, you know, maybe 10 lines or 100 lines of detail. And uh, what we're trying to do here with these little um, uh, uh, bar charts is to indicate what we, how powerful or effective we think the health architecture is. And I'll make a long story short, somebody has estimated rightly or wrongly, thoroughly or not thoroughly, we get back to that, that uh, we're gonna get, third, uh, if we implement the health architecture all at once in a big step, we will get 13% of the way from the 50 we're at uh, and uh, to 13% uh, of the way to the 90 we want to get to. So what did that say? This says that this is not worthless, but it's not as impressive as something that gets 75% of the way. Uh, so it's a, it's a contribution, but it's nothing to shout hurrah for. Okay. And uh, now, we, we not only estimate the effect, let's just say the main idea of the health architecture was to collect information. And this would be the, the effect on the primary um, uh, requirement. But then we, we look at the side effects. Side effects are simply all the other values and costs that were not the main reason for planning this health architecture. Uh, so, uh, and we find that it does a little bit of good on education. And we've got some two big fat question marks for uh, these uh, two things. And that means nobody has estimated, nobody has evaluated, and we don't know. It could even be a highly negative side effect. So this means there is a risk that if we simply implemented this and we didn't even make up our minds about what we're gonna get, we could get something surprisingly bad, which would kill the entire project. Uh, by the way, these are called known unknowns. You might have heard the uh, term. Okay, so uh, uh, primary effects, side effects, and then uh, the same evaluation for each one of our architectures at any level of high level architecture or detailed design. Uh, we actually sum it all up. And here we have a figure of merit called sum of values, uh, which tells us that this architecture uh, ain't worth shit. 
and and the uh, but the other two architectures get much higher scores, the other three. And so for the moment, maybe we could forget about this and focus on which one of these we want to deal with if we uh, value architectures that give lots of value when implemented. But then there's the problem of cost. So if, if, for example, these wonderful things had infinitely high costs, we probably couldn't do them. And, we'd, and if, if this uh, first one had trivial costs, well, we might do it. And the value to cost ratio might actually be uh, quite good. Now, it turns out that we've evaluated the costs of all architectures, and we've then computed the value to cost ratio. In other words, 36 divided by three should be something like 12. And we've even computed, you can do this on any spreadsheet, the best value to cost ratio, which happens to be this one in green. Uh, and if somebody said, uh, we should have a policy of delivering the strategies or architectures that have the greatest value to cost, then uh, this one called transport architecture, this would be the one we would go with in the early stages of uh, incremental uh, agile, okay? But, and this is going further than I have much time to do, we also have ways when we do the estimate of looking at the plus minus uncertainty of the estimate, the, the deviation, and the uh, quality of the data for the estimate, uh, let's call that risk analysis. And it turns out when you look at the risk analysis, other designs actually are better. They're less risky and maybe we should look at them. Of course, any spreadsheet like this can quickly be turned into a little bar chart so you can visualize the totality of values for this architecture and the totality of costs. Okay, in the way of presenting things. Now you are staring, if I had to stop here time-wise, which I fortunately don't, uh, uh, I would have given you a picture of what I mean by agile engineering, okay? We are looking at possible uh, agile delivery steps, but we're looking at them in multiple dimensions of value and cost using numbers derived from more or less credible sources and making decisions of prioritization of which one of these should be done first. When we do one first, we can and do measure what actually happens here with the values and costs. That's the feedback. Now, if everything is exactly as we predicted, we would say, jolly good, we seem to know what we're doing. But what if uh, this one delivered uh, 1% rather than, than 13%. What if the cost here uh, rather than 3% was 30%, okay? Then say, wow, we don't understand what we're doing. We don't understand the architecture. We have to sit down right now, analyze root causes of the problems and uh, try to correct them. More about that in a moment. Oh, glass of water. Years ago, I encountered a group at IBM Federal Systems Division building software for things like space shuttle and military systems, led by Harlan Mills, who I would characterize as the Leonardo da Vinci of software engineering, the genius. And IBM had assigned him a task we would all like to master. When you get a fixed price contract from the military or NASA, and if you run over time, you get a fine. And if you run over budget, you have to pay it yourself. And the qualities are extremely high, state of the art. This is the Cold War, actually. And uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with the Russians. Uh, uh, how do you actually ensure that if you got the contract because you were the lowest bidder, fixed price, fixed states, fixed qualities, how can you be sure to deliver on time, under budget, to the quality levels? And I'll make a long story short. They, they uh, were given a free hand to figure out how to do such things. And you can read about it, uh, for example, uh, in the, the links here uh, at the uh, University of Tennessee. But they, they mastered this. That is, all projects 
and, by, and by the way, the projects were done in typically 50, 5 zero, agile delivery steps or 2% steps. They consciously, uh, so th this is the 1980s and this is agile as it should be. And uh, certainly far superior to anything, the agile methods you have been learning and certified on like Scrum, because they have figure rates of 31% and things like that. Uh, you can uh, look that up on uh, Google that. And uh, these guys had zero failure uh, of delivering the high quality state of the art systems. And they were delivered fixed price uh, before the deadline every time for years on end. Now, um, uh, John Lennon had a little song about why will they never learn? And I'm tempted to sing that right here. If we have such good agile processes from the 1980s, why the hell aren't we at least doing what we knew in 1980s? Now, Santayana is famous for having said, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. IBM was initially having the same problems we have today with most of our agile projects, high degrees of total or partial failure, okay? They cracked it, they published it in IBM Systems Journal, available to all IBM customers, now available on the web if you like. And, uh, but nobody listened. IBM never tried to sell this method to anybody. They just used it internally as a competitive weapon and as a Cold War weapon. But now we know what they did. Uh, what the architect Quinnen did, I'll simplify, you can study this when you like. They deliver an increment and then they measure how, for example, how much availability they really got. And if the availability, which is say a primary quality of a military system or space system was not good enough, Quinnen went in and said, okay, my architecture isn't good enough. Let me find a better, more powerful architecture and let us try it out on the next iteration, okay? And they do. And let's just say for the sake of argument, his new architecture worked then uh, they they uh, uh, you know continue and they may uh, deliver other qualities and other values on other steps. But the point is, the architect intervenes when getting feedback about qualities and values and costs, and actually re-architects. So there's no idea of the architect does all the architecture. By guys, build it. That would be big bang waterfall, wouldn't it? The architect is an agile architect intervening based on data, feedback, and reality of measuring values and costs, and then getting a chance to do the architecture better again. I call this uh, dynamic, meaning at every step, designed to, uh, cost is the usual engineering term, but I call it designed to efficiency which is what they are in fact doing and describe doing and what I recommend, okay? So um, again, if you want to master agile, I suggest you adopt this method from the 1980s and go on from there, okay? Seven, Intel, everybody there, anybody there? Somebody yes. say yes. Next slide seven, yeah. Good, okay. Just have to double, double check. <clears throat> okay, now Intel is one of the largest adopters of my methods. Um, uh, for the last more than 20 years, more than 20,000 engineers have two day courses on my uh, agile engineering methods and they use them, okay? And they research them and publish them. So here is a one uh, publication of research on the use of language to do the requirements and design. And then my uh, specification quality control, previously known as inspection method, uh, to analyze, to inspect the requirements. Let me run through this with you. Uh, this is a one practical real example they publish. Um, and, and it is that they get handed a set of requirements of 31 pages for an Intel chip, okay? 
they uh, use specification quality control against fairly simple rules, like uh, standards, in other words, like it should be unambiguous, the requirement for the architect to understand. And uh, if it isn't, they call that a defect. And they found about 10 defects per page in all the pages. That's bad. By the way, this is already pretty good because normally, if they weren't using my planning language to write things clearly, there would be 100 defects initially. FaceTime video. Okay. Okay. So that was a telephone for my granddaughter in London. <laughs> I'm not going to take it. She's at the flat. Um, so, um, Okay, so, so basically Intel has calculated in their wisdom that this level of defects will not pay off, that the cost of finding them in the architecture phase and after chips are burned and spread is far too uh, late, and therefore they are going to say no exit, the, 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 the exit. Meet about your comic is not Okay, <laughs> she tried again, dear granddaughter. Okay, um, now uh, they have a thing called an exit level. Now they figured out that you, you can't go for perfection because you would go forever and you'd never get anything done. But they have figured out the 0.2 defects per page, page being 600 words, in case you wondered, uh, will um, uh, be an economic release level. They can deal with the very few remaining defects in later processes of say testing and things like that. But this is 50 times too high. So they're saying, you gotta be kidding. You know, don't you understand what it means to write clear, smart requirements, okay? So they go back and try again and they get better and better and, but they still get refused exit. So finally on their sixth attempt to hand over requirements, which are now at 45 pages, they only find 10 defects, they have a rate of 0 0.22, and they can exit. Okay. What are they? Okay. So the, uh, again, the long story of this is freely available in this wonderful publication. Now we're looking at agile engineering. Okay. We're staring it in the face. And uh, Intel has lots and lots of publications of what they've done with my methods, some in simply in published and some we have copies of if you're interested in it, okay? So again, they started doing this around 2000, okay? And by 2016, they had trained over 20,000 engineers and they gave up counting how many they were training, okay? So, but, so that's real agile engineering as practiced by a great company called Agile. And there are more like that, of course. Here is the same, um, uh, the uh, same uh, table that I showed earlier, slightly larger. And the main point of this is that um, uh, we can, given that we have numbers here of how, uh, you know, the, uh, the impact on five different values and two different costs, and we can, we can compute a value to cost ratio, then we can also automatically prioritize the one that comes up with the best uh, number or numbers. Uh, it could be we say, no, I don't want to prioritize this. I want to prioritize the one that has the lowest deviation, the plus minus uncertainty, and the highest quality of basis for the estimate. That would be this one here. Notice that this one here is three times better than this one here, not to mention how many, you know, 10 times better than this one. So this is by far and away the, um, so if, if you ask managers, do you feel lucky today, punk? Or would you like to be conservative and make sure you get good results? And hopefully the manager said, I'd like to be damn sure I get good results because otherwise I lose my job. Well, then you say, you have to do the workplace architecture, and here is the number, and here are the details, and uh, we can break it down. So, so notice what we're doing. We're engineering with regard to risk. 
We're engineering with regard to all costs. We're engineering with regard to all values. And we're in, we are making engineering decisions about priorities with regard to all of these numbers, okay? A kind of artificial intelligence to automatically compute what you should do on the next sprint, okay? It beats poker as far as I am concerned. This slide is, uh, sorry, we went one too many. Uh, there we go. Number nine is just a little note. I'm very tired of yellow stickies. I always resisted them. Uh, and uh, uh, what I'd like to suggest that it's modern times, yellow stickies could have been done uh, 100 years ago. Okay, we have things called digital computers that allow us to do our requirements and design digitally, as I've been showing you. And it's about time we stopped with the yellow stickies and started putting our planning information into a computer. And there are lots of ways of doing that. The simplest way is to put, for example, these tables on uh, a uh, spreadsheet. And we've been, we've been doing that for decades, okay? And now we've got special apps uh, like Valplan, which is uh, how this is done, uh, which uh, put in more and more knowledge of the engineering process. So it's about time we went digital, don't you think? Or are we gonna be doing yellow stickies for the next 50 years? Uh, that's silly when systems get this complex to try to keep track of anything with yellow stickies. I, I can't believe, I mean, it's childish games, kid stuff, stop it. If you're doing serious systems like a national health systems, okay, you're threatening my life with the kid stuff. Number 10, anybody can see number 10? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we all know that Agile discovered there was a major structural fault with the initial versions of Agile, and it, it didn't scale up to really large corporate things, and da-da, safe will save you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I was looking around at, at uh, SAFE and other uh, large-scale Agile methods one day, and I wasn't impressed, to put it mildly and politely. Some of you will know why others are probably using SAFE and getting certification in it. Uh, and I, I started talking with my friend Eric Simmons. Now, who is Eric Simmons? Well, aside from having wrote the foreword to my competitive engineering book about five years of experience at Intel, and uh, uh, he uh, is extremely well-read, extremely knowledgeable, and I test ideas with him, and I still do. And so I, 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 said, I wrote to him and said, Eric, all these scaling methods for Agile, they, they, they're, they're worth nothing, they're unnecessary. And he said, I said, I don't need them. My methods scale up to the largest possible projects. I've done them, we've done them. They also scale down to the smallest possible projects. You've done them, we've done them. What's all this scaling shit about? And he said, to make a long story short, Tom, you are right. And he, then he said something that shocked me a little bit. He said, Tom, your methods uh, do not scale. He wrote that in email. I read that and I thought, oh shit. I've misunderstood something. If Eric says that, I don't have methods that scale. I'm kidding myself. <clears throat> and then, but he continued and he said, actually, your methods are scale free. That is, they simply work at any scale. You don't have to choose one method for large systems, one method for small. If, if you use my methods, they, for some strange reason, perhaps my architecture or design, they work at any scale. This stuff works. We know because we've done it on large and small projects for 20 years at that point at Intel. Proof of the pudding. Now, um, if, if, finally, I wrote a little paper last summer published in IEEE 
uh, software and you can access it there about my scale-free agile methods. Uh, and the, the, the lady, um, Sarah Gregory, who ran the column there for many years uh, is a co-teacher with Eric at Intel of my methods. And she says nice things about my methods at the beginning of that article, okay? So uh, long story short, if you're worried about uh, uh, scale, do Gilb's agile engineering methods scale up and scale down? The answer is we have over 20 years experience that they do that. You can feel quite safe. They're designed to work at any scale. Got it? So here's an example, uh, and this is from 2003 in Norway. Okay. And we walked into a fairly small company that is 65 people worldwide with 16 developers worldwide, 13 programmers and three testers. And we explained our methods to them. Now I'm, I'm calling this relatively small scale. Their entire software organization was what some larger organizations would call one of many small teams with our 6,000 programmers or something like that. Okay, so I'm calling this small scale. And they learned our methods in one day of us presenting them, plus reading some of the writings we had. And they then published their results, which were quite startling. But let me just tell you what you're looking at here. You're looking at a spreadsheet, of course, okay? You're looking at a set of uh, requirements. They were very focused on usability, but not purely on usability. Here's testability and runtime speeds. And uh, these are, here you have the, uh, the uh, reference level, how uh, we call pass, and the minimum requirement, tolerable and the um, uh, success level, the goal. So these are requirements. These are four different, they divided their 16 developers into four different four people teams. And they gave each team a set of requirements, okay? And they gave them the, uh, our rules. They said, in a quarter of a year, we will release our software product to the entire world. Uh, at one later stage, they were delivering to about uh, as many countries as there are in the United Nations, 200 or something like that. And um, uh, at that point, we hope you will have achieved all our uh, goals, our numeric goals for how much better the usability is going to be. And uh, therefore, everybody will want to buy our product and not the competitor's product, which, by the way, they achieved. Okay. And they said uh, one rule. You will do this in Gilb's recommended weekly increments. Okay. So you're actually looking at week nine out of 12. And what you're looking at is the feedback. These numbers where it calls improvements percentage. That's the percentage uh, delivered incrementally up to now. So wherever it's 100 or more, they've met the goal. Wherever it's 99, 96, they're almost there, but 66 and 62 are not quite there. They have more work to do. So what they do is they turn around and say, right, on step 10, we better prioritize this one, which is only at 62, and this one, which is only at 66, and we shouldn't waste any time on these because we've already achieved our goal. So all these four teams are working in parallel on the same product but in such a way that they don't have dependencies to make a long story short. And uh, let me just take a look at the, uh, I haven't got, no, I haven't got. Uh, if you go to the case study, you'll find that they rapidly, uh, there's the case study uh, from our website. They, within three months, they achieved, uh, remarkably better qualities than they had ever had than, and that any competitor had. And they actually destroyed their international competition and bought them up. That's a small scale story of using my methods 
in case you wondered if they worked on a small scale. They also bragged about this on their website with our name on it and crediting our methods with being it. But there, now, by the way, we learned something. Why did these people do such a good job uh, that many other people in Norway and other countries hadn't really done? And we discovered they were all degreed engineers from the Norwegian Trondheim College of Technology. They were all classmates that went and did a startup. <laughs> so they were real engineers. So a lot of people listening to my talk now will not like or understand what I'm doing. And I'm guessing they are not real engineers. They're probably programmers or maybe certified uh, scrum people, okay? Uh, these people, uh, uh, this is all wasted on them. But uh, anybody who has an education in numeric skills, shall we say mathematics, accounting, science, and engineering, might wonder why we're not being more numeric and more engineering than we are. And uh, the reason is uh, the right people haven't been listening. The programmers have been running the world, not the engineers. Okay, so my suggestion is let let the non-engineers code and let the engineers rule, manage, plan, architecture. So uh, now I've run out of formal time and, uh, uh, and I think I'll just show you this slide and this slide and this slide. There's the stakeholder engineering book. Okay. Uh, oh, there's the free copy. <laughs> uh, I was so proud of myself that I wrote, I'm planning for years, I said, I'm going to write a book on stakeholder, stakeholders, and I finally did, and here it is, and uh, in, enjoy uh, going up to the next level above users and customers. Okay, um, I also uh, started writing a new, actually, I started writing a little paper with uh, uh, Musk's methods, it started out being a one page paper where he reveals his secret methods. Method number one, assume the requirements are wrong no matter who wrote them. That's interesting. <laughs> anyway, I started doing that uh, just a few months ago, and then I kept on collecting more and more and more and more specific methods that Musk is known to use in, in uh, SpaceX and Tesla. And so now, by this time, I have about a 60-page booklet, and I think that Elon Musk is the greatest agile practitioner on the planet. So forget Guild, forget my ideas, forget my methods. Get a hold of the Musk's methods book absolutely free and just copy what Musk does. By the way, he's got plenty of software. Half of my Tesla is software in case you didn't notice, but he does the whole system. He does multiple dimensions. Okay, so enjoy that. And uh, there's the first page of his engineering philosophy with the, uh, uh, the, the assume all requirements are done. And I noticed something about Musk methods that made me feel very friendly towards him. They are surprisingly similar to my own methods. And I've reformulated what he said orally and quickly so it reads better and added some more detail and suddenly we're doing my methods. Okay, but no time to do that. Here's the chairman of the CEO of Volkswagen being insanely jealous that he uh, hopes to produce cars uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in 30 hours at his plants uh, Musk is uh, uh, planning to do it three times faster already. And Volkswagen's been in the business a little bit longer of building cars than Musk. So if you're interested in uh, acceleration, use Musk's methods, don't use Volkswagen's methods. Okay, more and more and more from the book. Uh, end of presentation. And... Uh, 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 I'd like to offer you this book called Technoscopes. 
uh, we've, uh, we've had a lot of discussion about complexity of systems and complex systems. I can say uh, names like my uh, good friend Dave Snowden and Kenevan, but my view has always been that the problem is not that systems are complex. They are, but that we haven't got tools to understand and master the complex systems. I call these technoscopes, and I've written about 100 of them in this technoscopes book. So go get it if you really want to solve the complexity problem. And then a summary of talk with Guild's Agile Library once more. And let's see if I've got enough page. Oh, oops, go back a slide. We will. Well, I think I'll leave it here because we've got the the, the um, QR for and link to the slides, and we've got the library. And now we can, for another twenty five minutes, go into question and answers uh, session. And I will look at the thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, one of the questions we have from Tom James, one of our co-organizers, is. Would you recommend, and if so, how uh, mapping stakeholders to the relative interests they have in the qualities of the system? Tom, did I get that right? Uh, yeah, thanks, Imran. Yeah, Tom, I was just I was referring to I think it was slide I think it was slide four where you've got your stakeholders down the left and your values on the right hand side. Um, let's have a look. Uh, slide six. Slide six. Right. Yeah, so okay. You've got your stakeholders on the left. You've got your cost. Can you see six now? Yep. Okay. Six. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So it's just in, so you've got your stakeholders on the left, cost quality strategies. I'm assuming that each of those stakeholders will have different levels of interest in the cost. Correct. Is Definitely. there any way that you can identify the relative interest they have on each one of those? Yes. Okay, I'll make a long story short. Um, uh, in when we define these, say a quality, okay. Oh, let's see. When we define a quality, um, there we go. Like accessibility, we have a place to put which stakeholders are interested in accessibility. This provides a digital link. Okay, so let's say, you know, stakeholder one, two, and three are interested in accessibility. We record that when we specify accessibility, uh, you know, together with its scale of measure, its uh, measuring tools, its uh, levels of, of uh, uh, goal levels and things like that. Now, uh, in the tool called Valplan here, I have a little um, thing I can turn on called linked mode. And if I turn on linked mode, there will it will automatically draw from say this stakeholder down to accessibility and this stakeholder down to accessibility. It will automatically draw the relationship. Okay, this is what we a benefit we get from digitalization. Once we digitally tell the computer that accessibility has three stakeholders, we can draw the relationship and we can get rid of things that don't interest us, like maybe all the other qualities and just say, uh, who are all the stakeholders who are interested in access accessibility? So long story short, we keep track of that and we do it digitally and we can display it in various graphical formats. Does that answer your question, Tom? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Tom. I couldn't see just from the visual, I couldn't, I no, couldn't no. see that there was a relationship. Well, yeah. that's a static visual. We have a, a tool we've developed, developed by Richard Smith in UK for uh, six years now, which is very mature. And this is just one of very many things you can do. So a second thing I'm not even mentioning is that you can automatically uh, draw all current uh, 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 relationships of everything to everything uh, on a selective basis if you wanna talk about it. Cool. And you can't yeah, do that. You can't do that with yellow stickies very well. Yeah. I've seen some of Kai's live live bow plan demos. So I, th I think I've probably seen this actually. Right. Yeah. So go to guild.com and look at our videos for free.
I hope it's free. <laughs> some are free, some are not. Well, he is Tom one one more Tom, so he should get it for free. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, we have another question in the chat from Ilian. Uh, how do you approach requirements gathering from all the stakeholders you have identified, and when can you use this in your method to determine the priorities? Right. Okay, I think I got the. Is this Ian McKenna, by the way? No, another Ian. Ian Simon, probably. Ilian. Ilian. Ilian, can you unmute, please, yourself? Yeah. yeah. Who is <laughs> Just a moment. Yes. Eliana. Eliana, oh, sorry. My, Let's my call mistake. It, 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 we'll do Elaine. Hi. <laughs> Amsterdam, huh? Yes. Okay, welcome. Uh, okay, so um, now remember the question. Uh, okay. Let me simplify. I, 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 will, I will tell you what I do with my students, which is the same as I do with my clients. I, I start off with a, a blank, uh, usually a blank computer. We, we put this directly in the computer. We could use yellow stickies at this point. And I ask a very simple question. What is your most critical stakeholder? Or let's say I have five people in the room. Would you each write down independently what you think is your most critical stakeholder, the one that determines your success and failure? And they might write down five different stakeholders, and they might all be very critical, okay? So it's, it's this, what is your critical? Yeah. Then I ask them to say, okay, make that your stakeholder for the duration of this training course, or, um, uh, and then uh, for each, for your stakeholder, what is the most critical value that that stakeholder has? And, and now we're into this gang here, like uh, uh, number one says it's accessibility and another one says it's fixed overhead costs. And another one says my stakeholder is interested in intelligibility, right? So this, what is the most critical value for that critical stakeholder, right? I then say, right. Actually, on the first day of a two-day BCS course, which we've held many of in London, uh, and some in Norway, and many in Poland, um, we uh, and none in Amsterdam of late, except maybe my son Kai has. Um, we we I then teach them how to define intelligibility quantitatively. Okay, and uh, uh, and that takes up day one. Then we have a, like a one page definition of exactly uh, how do we measure, quantify intelligibility. On day two, I said, right, you've defined this intelligibility thing. Now I want you to uh, design how to get there. Uh, write down the most powerful, effective architectural idea you can think of to get intelligibility and ask a simple question, will this do the job? Will this get you to your goal? If no, by the way, we're doing the impact estimation at that moment very informally. If you say no, then bring in an additional or better design or architecture and say, if I use this one or both of them, will I get to my goal? If yes, stop the design process and test it in practice. If no, continue the process until you believe either through intuition, good luck, or engineering using the impact estimation table, I have enough architecture to reach my goal. Now, uh, Elaine, I'm trying to ex answer your question. Have I missed any points yet? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think, yeah, I was during the presentation, it sounds very simple, but my experience is that's quite difficult to get all these requirements from all the stakeholders and make some sense of it. Eh? So um, the different question here is how do you get the stakeholders requirements from the stakeholders? That is a different question than I answered. But uh, so I, I, I tried, I answered what I thought you had said, you know, I, I, I asked, let's call them analysts and people working with me on the project, uh, you know, what is the most critical one? Now, so let's assume there's a different question. How do you elicit 
information from a stakeholder about what their requirements are, okay? And we could even simplify, so forget all the stakeholders, let's, let's imagine any user or customer, because we're very used to that problem. And you are absolutely right. It is very difficult to get their requirements from them, right? Now, by the way, I have a booklet I will send you for free if you ask for it, just you, Elaine, called Plan Analysis. And that is my book on how to analyze the and, and find out what the requirements are. You will also find that at Lean Pub if you other people want to go and get it. So there's, in other words, it's such a long answer that I needed a book to explain it, but I'll give you some ideas there. And most of you know some of this. For example, uh, you, you're talking to someone and they say, I want a distributed international database, okay? And you say, that's not your requirement. So yes, it is. We've already started the project. We've already contracted with Oracle. We're just implementing it. I said, you don't want the database. What do you mean I don't want the database? But of course I want the database. No, uh, 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 and then you, you, you use what we call the Japanese five whys, which you will all have heard of. And they say, why do you want the international database? Uh, well, of course, so that I can get uh, quick answers all over the globe. Ah, so that sounds to me like your requirement. What if you, why don't we write down your requirement of how quick, of what type of answers you want in what places in the globe? That's what I do. We'll call it the quick answer all over the globe requirement. Now, why don't we leave the problem of whether you need a distributed database all over the globe to your systems engineering architect? Because they will not only figure out whether you need that database or not, but they will solve a large number of other problems like the security problem simultaneously, okay? You can't have a user dictating your architecture because all they can think of is a distributed database all over the globe. That's not on, it needs to be, the, that job needs to be delivered to a professional systems architect who considers all the critical criteria. Your, your user or your stakeholder cannot do that, will never do that, and is not qualified to do it. Okay, so the, the simple answer, it's amazing the power of why, to elicit what the stakeholder will admit that they really want and get them out of the trap of requiring technology that they don't know enough about to require. That's my short answer. The long answer is in the analysis book, which you will get if you send me an email for free. And if that doesn't answer your question, ask more, I'll give you more. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. By the way, the analysis book is one of the 20 books I've written the last four years, which are not sold by Amazon. Most of them are at my Lean Pub site, and they're all digital, and most of them are free to nice people. We, we all are nice, Tom. We all are nice. Okay. I believe it. Everybody here is nice people. No, that, that's the reason we are in this session, right? We are all. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I love my Dutch friends. Uh, the D Dutchmen have a national character. They are, in order to survive as a nation, they're all engineers at heart. Therefore, they all tend to like my methods. Yeah, Ian has a uh, point. Ian, you want to speak? I will Ian question. I was just saying that. Um, yeah. W.A. Hosier wrote a white paper in 1961 about capturing requirements where he said that um, even when requirements are being captured before they're finalized, how they will be verified needs to be assessed and decided. Okay. To make now, sure remember that, that slide, tested. I uh, uh, hope I'm not jumping the gun and understanding it, but correct me if I am. Remember the slide we had from Intel? Yeah. Where, okay. That is my number one way of quality controlling requirements. It's called, uh, it used to be called um, uh, software inspection. I wrote a whole book about that. You can still buy 500 pages, but we have simplified that method drastically by factor 100. 
uh, to, and we call it a different name therefore called specification quality control. Ian, if you write me an email note and say, I want to know about review methods and especially that specification quality control, I will send you the information. Thanks, Tom. And by the way, it's not the only way of checking requirements. I already alluded to another way by implementing design early and seeing how it works and how the stakeholders react, you are also effectively checking the requirements. So, uh, so specification quality control is uh, what we call static static testing. It's a, you know, you're, you're looking at the requirements and they're not being executed in any sense yet. Okay. But as I'm very interested in the subject of quality control and review, and uh, I'll send you at least a basic explanation of the specification of quality control. Tom, there is a, the end of that question there, or that the remark. It says how to uh, how to verify the conformance of the requirement. Ah. ah, yes, of course. So that that would be by in its simple terms by measuring it after uh, uh, um, you've implemented enough strategies to think you might be reaching it. Yeah, but if where Hosey was coming from was that in the specification of the requirements, those things need to be agreed as part of the capturing of the requirements. How do we actually verify the conformance? Okay, let, let um, me give you one thing. I have a thing in my planning language called a meter. And in a requirement, which is going to be measured, I specify one or more different meters, as in thermometer, voltmeter, oscilloscope, right? And uh, uh, so uh, in other words, we plan the meter for several reasons. One, to um, indicate to people that don't you think you're not gonna be measured because this is how we're gonna do it, <laughs> okay? And the other is to ascertain whether the meter is economic. That is, you have the time people to do it every week, for example, okay? So for example, my friends that confirm it, uh, finally, home, uh, they, early homed in on, we will never use more than 30 minutes per week to actually test the level of the values. We'll simplify, that's good enough. That's an example of making a corporate policy decision on your feedback mechanisms. And, but they also said that before we release to 200 countries and all of our customers, we will have far more thorough testing than just a half an hour, okay? So there, I can send you, papers from Confirmit on their testing ideas, which are then interlocked with my own ideas. Tom, can I add something please on the quality please, specification Trevor. control? It works brilliantly on contracts. And if only lawyers would actually use these techniques, we would have far better quality contracts and quite frankly, far better quality legislation in the first place. Very good. Trevor is, uh, how long have we known each other, Trevor? 10, 15 years? <laughs> oh, at least, I think. Tom. And, and yeah. Trevor is, a, a, like uh, my other friend, Nils Maloto, are excellent long-term practitioners of the ideas I'm talking about. And they have their own original ideas to add in addition, I should add, which I respect. <laughs> There's one from Segun, Segun Eros, and uh, how do we get these resources, please? Such an amazing session. So, Tom? Uh, uh, sorry, the source. Uh, do you, do you, do you, if, if she means the slides, the, the um, okay, I'll certainly, let me go to the slides. Let's see. Um, ah, there we go. Okay. So take a photograph. Wow. It's like, oh, yeah. there, there it is. Take a photograph for that and you have the slides. You can either use the, the link or you can use the QR to go to the link. But you will find a PDF file of these slides together with a much earlier, what the, version I used in another context, but uh, you know, take the PDF with today's date on it and you have all of these slides, which gives you the links to all the other free literature, doesn't it? 
and right, share it you. with your friends. Share it with nice people freely. Put it on your LinkedIn or Twitter site. <laughs> hey, there's the most amazing set of slides with lots of free literature. <laughs> Great, thank you, thank you. Any more questions from anybody? We have officially seven more minutes just to, I believe, correct? Yeah. Tom, if there are no more questions, could I um, offer just um, a little yes. bit of additional information, please, on Trevor, the estimation? A practitioner, paper. please share. Yeah. I've, and, I've uh, could, them, could Trevor, put your email or website in the chat if anybody wants to contact you. And uh, right, Neil's do the that. same. I'll do that. Um, I just wanted to add something on impact estimation tables. Um, you know, just said, type this email. This is my email. Um, it's, as far as I'm concerned, this is probably the most powerful application of Tom's methods of all of them, but it really does bring all of them together in, in something that makes a great deal of economic sense. I've used impact estimation tables, or I think Tom now calls them value decision tables. In the past, I've also used the term action prioritization tables because that's exactly what they do. They prioritize actions. But the most powerful application I have for these is the actual development of information systems and technology strategy. Because if you know your objectives, particularly your commercial objectives for the company that you're working with, either as a contractor or as an employee. And you know the, and from which you can actually derive what Tom calls the strategies or the different options that you have for implementing uh, strategies to meet those objectives. If you put it into an impact estimation table, it absolutely very clearly prioritizes those actions that you can take which will best meet the objectives, the commercial objectives. And it makes selling your IT strategy to the C-suite in particular, and particularly the chief executive, a hundred times easier. So I cannot recommend the use of impact estimation tables, action prioritization tables, value decision tables, whatever you'd like to call them. They are basically the same thing. I cannot recommend them enough. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, and I recommend, Trevor knows what he's talking about and has done this uh, uh, many times at many large and interesting corporations. So I highly recommend uh, any practice he has. Niels, you're also a great practitioner. You wanna put in a pitch for anything? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I coach projects not only to deliver the right stuff, but also to deliver it uh, very quickly. And I call that just delivering quality on time, the right stuff at the right time, uh, which actually is the first part of the impact estimation table and the second part of the impact estimation table. Yeah. So, Niels, would you be happy to hold a separate lecture for this gang about your ideas? Because I know you have them. Yes, yes, I could uh, do a presentation from a different angle. Yeah. How to, how to organize better. Yeah, sure, Neil. I would, I would reach out to you. Anyway, I'll send you a LinkedIn request right now. So. Niels is a Dutchman. Great. So, <laughs> did I say more? <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Stay kind. Okay. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to you, Neil. Yeah, great. Yeah, any more questions? Any more insights anybody has to offer? I've, I've got a question if nobody else has. Tom, go ahead, Tom. Cool. So, Tom just, to Tom. as we're talking about the impact estimation, just so I understand how that table works. So it's the idea that you've got, you've got your requirements and you've got some solutions. Is the idea with the, I'm trying to understand the level that those solutions are at. So is the idea that you've got each solution uh, in Tom, an architecture? Uh, Tommy, interrupt you. 
um, we can uh, do multiple or many le related levels. So the answer is any level you want of detail or overview. Okay. So, the, so with the, the level that you that you you, dem you demonstrate on your on your visual. Yeah, that was like top. You were, you were it was top. a high level architecture. You picked one. So you, it was a, a selection method, and you picked one of those. Yeah. Right. That's right. Not only that, but when I've picked one top level architecture, I can then decompose it into 10 approximately sub architectures and rate them on a separate table. I do that all the time. It's completely normal. Because as you drill down, I'm guessing that those architects might not cut through, might not cut through all of those requirements. Some of those, some of those lower okay. level architectures. Would, okay. Would... I, I have a principle I teach. When decomposing a larger architecture into smaller sub-architectures, you have two conditions you must satisfy. Every one of them must be able to deliver numeric measurable value when delivered. And every one of them must be able to be done first before any of the others without any dependencies. And that's those are a set of new rules for decomposition for agile uh things so uh and I, I write about that in my various books and if you can't find it ask me by the way one more announcement at the end uh, a few days ago i started writing a new book on the table and i even renamed the table just for fun i call it value impact estimation vi vi okay because the the strategies are vying for our attention ah okay and I've, I'm sort of one third of the way through the book, but I was going to send a copy to Trevor. And uh, I will announce when it's more or less done on my LinkedIn and Twitter sites, and you can probably download a free copy at that point. And it talks about these things. But it is a one day training course to get the impact estimation table. And I didn't have time to explain everything here, but it's in the books I've already given you. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure, Tom. Good name, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Tom to Tom. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. One stupid joke at the end. You've uh, you've you've all all heard of the Tom Tom GPS system, right? In Holland. Yeah. Well, w one day I was making a pitch. Uh, uh, my son is called Kai Thomas, named after his father Thomas, right? And uh, the, the first slide in front of the co-founders of TomTom Tom was, what can Tom and Tom do for TomTom? Tom? <laughs> yeah. We got a contract. <laughs> Great. Yeah, let's do it. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, well over our time. Uh, not well over, really. Uh, any more questions before we before we stop. And uh, Neil has kindly posted the webinar link. So please register. Also, we'll be, uh, I will be approaching me either or Tom to Neil uh, to have a session in one of our uh, meetups uh, coming months. Please watch the space. Uh, if no more questions, thank you, Tom, very much. Uh, we thank organizers, you. we organizers will be staying back. If anybody wants to stay back to have a chat with us, more than welcome. But thank you very much, Tom. Mike, sorry, Mike, everyone. Mike has a final question. Mike, oh, sorry, Mike. No problem. Sorry, um, Tom, I wonder just to contextualize us, if you wouldn't mind bringing up slide 11. Coming up. Thank you. Um, let's see, get to E11 yeah. and... Yep, that's great. So one of the questions that I had was uh, across those values, across those requirements that you've got there, are, are they not weighted? So when you get a 36% sum of values, if that's not weighted, are, are we assuming that they're all of the same weight? Okay, Mike, uh, thanks for your question. I'll give you a short answer. Number one, um, the, the data or information on the table allows you to prioritize, i.e. decide what to do next, right? Now notice I did not use the word weight at all. 
weight is, in my view, a primitive and bad tool for advanced software engineering. It's good in small scale thinkings like grades you get at school or something like that. So I, I, if you write me I, and say, give me the argument why your method is better without weights, I'll give you some papers I've written where I argue that uh, weighting is a stupid idea for complex systems and dynamic prioritization like this is a much smarter idea. I've written several papers on it. So let me just make sure that we're talking about the same things. So we you talk right. about collection of data, education, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Um, yep. But you might say that education in this particular context is far more uh, important, let's say, than stay healthy or et, et cetera, et cetera. So the weighting right. that I would give each one of those to get to my 36% yeah. may be Okay, uh, let, me, let me put what I said another way. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be very brief because we're at the end. Um, the idea of getting to the 95% of education, that is its weight. <laughs> okay. Right, so it's built in. Okay, fair it's enough. built into the idea of when I get to 95 before the end of next year, I'm cool, okay? Uh, and I can go deeper into that idea because we have a number and we have a date. And that is much better than a, a stipulated weight by an anonymous person with, who has no responsibility for setting the weight. And again, I'll send you papers arguing the case. No, that makes perfect sense to me. Thanks, Tom. Good. But I'd love to send you my paper and let you read it. <laughs> I've got your email address. Thank you. Uh, okay. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was just in time. Okay. Uh, as I said, thank you, Tom, very much for a wonderful insight uh, into, into your experience and your models and your uh, way of thinking about agility. Uh, that was really an eye opener for me, at least. And uh, Niels, I'll be approaching you. And as I said, people who want to chat with the organizers uh, organizers if you want to stay back we'll be there for another five ten minutes yeah thank you thank you I'll, I'll stay on i'll just tell my wife we'll have dinner in about five or ten minutes <laughs> that's quite late tom <laughs> thanks so much tom thanks tom. thank you thank you thanks tom okay thank you approved approved by the boss <laughs> <laughs> okay trevor you don't usually hold public lectures about your wealth of knowledge <laughs> so you're quite right i'm not a very good lecturer i'm afraid i'm not nearly as good as you are <laughs> but, that, but yes but you have all kinds of wonderful experiences that you should i think you should share more than you do Maybe the organizers will, will try to uh, suss out of you something. Right, okay. <laughs> Trevor, I think you do it very well. Only you do it for the, the Guild in crowd, but maybe you can do it for others as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm currently investigating um, a quite an interesting concept, which is basically um, linking all the uh, basically products and services and systems of companies to the business model it's proving to be quite a quite a challenge that you talk about multi criteria and multi um, value systems tom this is a this is a big one well i'd like to hear more about it so i i will attend the north north Hamps session where you hold the lecture <laughs> Uh, anyway, we, we, we can have a discussion about that. It's quite fun. Okay. Definitely. Trevor, I will approach you. <laughs> yeah. Great, Abby, great. No, it was... Sorry, Mike, go on. Abby, curious to know what you guys think in, in terms of architecture about the continual debate about upfront architecture versus emergent architecture and sort of where you stand on that. I think upfront architecture, Mike, is... is um, uh, inevitable in most companies and it's called legacy <laughs> uh, the, the point is that how do you move from your legacy architecture 
to an architecture that is actually more appropriate for your future systems and, and basically your future products and services. So I think I agree with that. What do you think of Greenfield Project? Then? Well, there you've actually got you've got a nice situation because you've got a blank canvas on which you can build. But the problem is, in if you go into a specific company, it's very seldom that you do have a blank canvas. There's always some sort of commercial imperative that is actually limiting the number of um, options you have. And if you go into a startup. There, you've got more of a blank canvas, but yeah. there are so many options. And once you've actually decided on a particular option, it kind of constrains you from there. So emerging architecture, that's, a, that's an interesting one. And I think you are masters of your own destiny, but sometimes it's going to cost quite a bit to get to the architecture that you think is most appropriate for what you want. I mean, if you, if you take the, the, the stereotypical agile approach, um, which says, you know, not don't do any upfront design, but, but limit it because we don't know what's going to happen down the line. And certainly it, it emerges from our interactions. Mm. Yeah, Tom, you wanted to make a point? <clears throat> well, um, I completely agree with everything Trevor says, and he's, he's very deep there, that it, our reality is uh, um, almost always that the existing architecture must be taken into consideration at the base. And all you can, now you can either build a new one in parallel and eight years later, try to take it into use, but that won't work, all history says, it'll bomb, okay? So the only sane thing to do that I've done all of my 60 years in this business is I, in an agile manner, I move the old architecture to the new dream architecture over a series of steps of, uh, 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 of an, uh, and that's the safest, simplest way to do it and get large results and avoid failures. Do you think that that's still true when you're trying to go from, for example, a monolith to a microservice architectural base? Uh, now, there may be a point where, uh, uh, for example, I was just reading a wonderful book by Hastings of um, uh, Netflix where they talk about their uh, transition to microarchitecture in desperation to avoid you know, all the dependencies. So, uh, and, and that was extremely painful, but they did it. Uh, so so the, the answer is sometimes there is a sub-architecture. Let me call that a sub, that's not the architecture. The microservices is, a, is a, one of many ideas that make up what I would call the total architecture of the system. And you might have to, you know, there may be no halfway house there. You might have to transition from one database system to the other, one from uh, a, a stupid architecture to microservices. And, uh, it, and, but that is just one step, which I usually, if it takes a long time, I do it in the background. And then when it's ready, I deliver it as an incremental step. Okay, uh, again, we have a long discussion on this, but uh, it, it depends on the, the very broad definition I have of architecture, that yeah. the micro architecture is one little technical thing. It's not the architecture. Because yeah. there's also often a transitionary state, isn't there, where you've gone from legacy and you know where you want to go, but it's not achievable immediately. And so you need to have these interim states where it's halfway houses that are almost throwaway architecture on, yeah. on a journey to get to an end state. Cor correct. The only and question is, is that the smartest, simplest, safest way to do it or not? If yeah. it is, temporary architectures are fine. I call them scaffolding and always yeah. have to use them. As does Dave Snowden, yeah. Um, yeah. But also, the, the reason that I ask is because that's sort of some of the things that I'm looking at at the moment. And the transition, once you've got the architecture in place, you've got to consider, as you say, the whole systemic uh, organization because there's, you know, how do we elicit requirements in this new way of working? How do we interact with our stakeholders in the new way of working? How do teams pivot and change? There's the, the ramifications are, are quite extensive. If you um, send me an email, I'll send you a set of slides, which you might uh, call Managility, which is extremely advanced view of agility uh, like at U.S. Department of Defense, and they're constantly 
there are people like Steve Blank is a very good one, steveblank.com. He's thinking about these problems because they have these enormous legacy systems. And in a sense, they need to go very much in the direction of microarchitectures. And they're talking about how to do it. I think you'll find food for thought in, in the slides and the reference in slides and Steve Blank in particular. But I'll send it to you, the link, if you send me uh, something. Also, just generally speaking, if you want some really advanced stuff of that nature, steveblank.com is a free sort of weekly newsletter. And he's extremely advanced and, and uh, extremely interesting. And it's free. <laughs> so you can make up your mind. If you want really advanced and really interesting, right? He's also, of course, the guy who um, uh, invented Lean Startups, really, not Eric. That was his student. Fair enough, thank you. Great. Any more, anything before we call it a day? No, just thanks very much to Tom. Yeah, Tom, and uh, kudos to you. I haven't seen so many people uh, stopping or rather waiting uh, after the talk has ended. So thank you. <laughs> that shows the gen uh, interest it has generated. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Imran. Good. I love to talk with interesting people over email or otherwise. So, uh, in fact, you know, I haven't got a proper job. I'm retired, right? So I've got nothing to do except talk to you nice people. So don't hesitate to ask.